the thing that we see about millennials is just the tip of the iceberg, as I would say, right? There's a lot more that people don't notice because everyone's just focusing on the tip, what's above the surface. But if you really get to know people on an individual basis, there's so much that they can contribute to teams and uh, you know to the companies, which often gets missed because that it's not it's not sensational news, right? So that's why we always tend to focus on what's on the tip of the iceberg. But um, that being said, there are generational differences. It's just that not everyone embodies it to a T, right? There are of some course. people who don't. In fact, in fact, uh, even in, within the millennials, um, we have the Xenials who are nineteen seventy nine to about nineteen eighty four who kind of feel like they are part of a Gen X and part of millennials, right? So they tend to feel like I, I kind of fit both. They are mm -hmm. kind of the cuspers, right? And they, they feel like they are uh, a bit of both. And so that's why it's important for us to know that, you know, this is just generationally speaking uh, in a bigger group. These are the kind of, um, you know, behaviors we see, but it doesn't always necessarily of course. Uh, kind of apply to every single person. Hi everyone, welcome back to the HR Leaders Podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by Vivek Iyani, who's a millennial keynote speaker, coach and author of the book, Engaging Millennials. During the episode, Vivek shares how to recruit, reward and retain millennials in the workforce and the top trends and forces that widen the generational gap at work. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Vivek, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Chris. Thanks for having me. Where are you at the moment? You're not you're not in your normal spot, are you? Yeah, normally I'm in Singapore, but now I'm actually in uh, India. I'm in the state of Kerala. So in the south side of India and I'm here uh, visiting my relatives. Nice. Oh, well, you're under pressure then. You have to impress the relatives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, are you staying here over the holidays or are you going back soon? Yeah, yeah we're staying here for a while because uh, we haven't connected in a while. So we'll be here until end of December and then after Christmas we'll fly off. Nice, nice, nice. Um, tell everyone a little bit more about yourself personally and your journey to, to where we are now and the work that you do. Sure. I started out uh, my career in schools. In fact, I went to schools to do a lot of enrichment programs. And those enrichment programs basically meant I was teaching about you know leadership, study skills, presentation skills. And after I did that for a while, I kind of realized that, you know, um, what if I could do the same thing, but for uh, the corporates? But at that point in time, uh, because I never joined any corporate uh, company, I was like, how would I even present myself to the corporates when I don't have any corporate experience? I've not managed a team. But one thing I did have, which I considered a weakness, was uh, I had experience speaking to these young people, these teenagers, these students in colleges. And I kind of asked them, you know, like, what are your fears of, you know, uh, going into the workplace? So they actually mentioned they fear misunderstanding their boss, uh, not being able to communicate effectively, or uh, what if they have a very uh, difficult boss? <laughs> and all of that questions uh, kind of made me realize, hey, that's interesting. Uh, let me see what the bosses have to say. So I started asking a few friends about, you know, what, what are your thoughts of the younger generation? And I got a very visceral response <laughs> from them. They were like, oh, they're very hard to manage. They very entitled, demanding, and and that get, that made me realize, oh my goodness, there is such a, such a, a animosity almost uh, towards the younger generation coming in from the older generation. And so I was very curious to understand why that is. And that got me uh, on this path of researching, why is it that we see this one particular generation getting a lot of hate, a lot of uh, criticism, uh, about their work ethics, the way they do things, the expectations and demands. And I really wanted to find out what is it all about. But when I did a Google search, a lot of the content I got was based on a US demographic uh, and not a lot on an Asian demographic. So I was like, hey, maybe there's something there that I can explore. And uh, that's what I did. I basically started to uh, you know, speak to leaders in organizations just like you do, right? And I went to interview them. I went to the offices, asked them what's the experiences like, 
uh, did focus group discussions, and really just basically to find out what the challenge is when it comes to engaging with millennials. And that's how I've basically come to do what I do right now. Amazing. Is that what led to the book then, Engaging Millennials? Exactly. Yeah. So the the book really uh, helped me to kind of crystallize the conversations I've had with them and kind of uh, map out the patterns that I've seen in all these conversations. So what are the things that millennials are saying they want from a workplace and a manager? And what are the things that, you know, the organizations are expecting from millennials as well, right? So I kind of uh, distill all these conversations into the book. So what, what would you say then would are the say top, I know there's a lot, but top three things that millennials are looking for? They want everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's say the top three they're looking for, for, for the from the workplace and their manager. So if you look at a great resignation, one of the key things that, you know, um, are leading a lot of the millennials specifically to leave is the fact that, number one, they don't see room for growth, right? And um, some may say that they are being impatient because growth is going to happen if you stay long enough. But for them, they do tend to have an instant gratification mindset. So they do want to see growth in a more short-term basis as opposed to a longer-term basis. A second is feedback, right? And feedback uh, from their manager that also gets implemented on. They they want to be able to get more regular feedback and coaching um, uh, from uh, their managers so that they can know exactly what they need to be working on in the here and now, right? So again, very focused on how can I constantly be improving. And it, it's more of um, affirmations of what are the things that I'm doing right. Right. And the third thing that they're looking for is, of course, um, uh, the freedom to be able to work from home and, you know, have that uh, uh, whole concept of don't measure the time I'm working, but measure the kind of task I'm getting done uh, so that I'm that, so that you can use my productivity to be measured in a different way. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that I think the top three things that they are really looking for in organizations. Yeah, I would I would categorize these three as the ones that keep coming up over and over again. Yeah, it's so interesting because when I was younger, the idea of progression was maybe like one or two years, you know, you would progress and learn and but now it's got shorter and shorter and shorter <laughs> and shorter. And, and I've even, <laughs> I've even no noticed it in my younger employees as well. They want progression fast, quickly. They want to they grow through the ranks very, very quickly. They, they want the feedback, yeah. like you said, um, you know, the constant feedback. So yeah, it, I, I can completely agree. And uh, how is that then affecting tradi traditional managers <laughs> and leaders? Is that is that one of the reasons they're getting frustrated? What, what were the main frustrations yeah. you're hearing? Yeah, so you know the traditional managers, interestingly, have a my way or the highway kind of a mindset when it comes to leading their teams. And uh, what happens is what then ensues is a power struggle <laughs> between the millennial and the managers. Like, mm. no, I want to do it this way, and then the millennials like. Why can't we try it this way? Right? Why can't we try a different approach? And when the manager just blatantly refuses to listen or uh, you know disagrees uh, with the individual, then that that creates a kind of uh, animosity or a kind of a friction in the relationship, working relationship with one another, and then that slowly uh, snowballs into something bad, right? So uh, the traditional managers find that you know they cannot work with them effectively because. In the first place, there's already certain uh, amount of bias, and uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of friction that's happening that also compounds and reaffirms the bias. Mm -hmm. So the confirmation bias gets confirmed by the experiences <laughs> that they have, and then they what they do is then they say all millennials are like that. But um, there is a real uh, difference in terms of expectations uh, and the way the the working styles are a little different. Uh, you know, their motivations are different. So there are some differences. The key is, uh, as a leader, are you willing to adapt instead of expecting them to adapt to you? And uh, and I think this is the interesting thing. When I did these focus groups, I went to companies and I asked them, hey, uh, can you show me the best managers who are loved by your millennials, maybe three of them, and the ones that are the most complained about by millennials, and let's get them together in a group. And I asked them, can you guys describe millennials, right? Share some words. What's interesting is all of them said that millennials are entitled, demanding, um, instant gratification, they're weak, 
We, we they said we. The same kind of words. They yeah, said we. Wow. We right. Yeah, instant gratification. Strawberries in that sense, right? Snowflakes. They had those same words. Even the good managers had the same things to say about the millennial generation. And then I I found it really interesting because I would have thought they would have said something more positive, right? But they said, you know, this is this is who they are. But the way I've learned to work with them is by realizing that I can't change them. I've got to be the one that's willing to change and see what works with them, right? So what we do notice is that it's not exactly millennials that are the problem. It's the way managers are reacting to the way millennials are. That's a problem. So if you are reacting in a very traditional manner, which is my way is the highway authority and all of that chain of command, it's not going to give you the result you desire. But if you decide to adapt and change the way you engage with them, change the way you listen to them and work with them, that is actually giving them the results that they desire. Mm -hmm. So it's really about the competencies that these leaders have yeah. that will help them to engage with the millennials that makes a difference. What, what were some of the things that those good managers are doing that just stood out? Right. So one of the key things that we've noticed uh, from those managers is that they really listen for feedback. They're open to ideas. They're open to this whole idea of experimenting with different kinds of things. So if there's an event that they need to run, and uh, you know they usually run it in a specific way, when they ask for suggestions, those suggestions are actually taken into account, even though it is an experiment. Well, the fact that they even ask for suggestions is a good up. thing. <laughs> the fact yeah. that they, that's already a good step that they ask for suggestions. That's already something that most leaders exactly. don't do. <laughs> so they, they really um, embrace the fact that, hey, you know, um, I know you're new, but I want to tap on your new ideas. I want to tap on your energy. I want to tap on your enthusiasm. These are the things that they really bring to the table. So I want to tap on all of those and see how we can make this work. And if it doesn't work, we agree to go back to the way it used to work. Mm -hmm. So we have an understanding. It's not like I, I let go of all responsibility and let you take the, the reins. No, it's not like that. We look into making this better. And more often times than not, there are a lot of things that both parties can contribute uh, to making the event a bigger success. And that's what's missing when we have intergenerational conflict. They don't share what they have. The, the, they don't share their strengths. Mm -hmm. They don't put it on the table and the company loses out at the end. So you really kind of got to also create that psychological safety though, in order for them to yes. feel comfortable to do that. You know, if they're going to, if they, if they give an idea and get shut down, <laughs> immediately they're not gonna yeah. they're not gonna do it again right <laughs> and come exactly. back exactly like what's the point what's the point of asking if it if all my suggestions go into a black hole what's the point of me giving any suggestions in the first yeah. place right so yeah and then in, and then in, very important and in turn they're going to become disengaged immediately yes mm -hmm. absolutely yeah when they feel like the organization the management isn't listening to them or like whatever feedback they've been asking you've been asking for feedback that's great but what happened to the feedback then that then happened, right? You have to really communicate. So we've gotten your feedback and this is the person that we've directed your feedback to. And this is the person who will be getting back to you in this much amount of time around this topic. Or we've gotten your feedback and we are looking into it. We need some time to get back to you, right? Having that very basic communication of what's been done with the feedback that has been collected is so key to letting them know that, hey, we are listening mm. and we are taking steps in the right direction. We yeah. are going, we are directionally correct. You mentioned, so given all of, of what we just discussed then, how do you then implement this into an effective recruitment strategy? You now, what, what, what are the key things that companies are doing to hire this, this group of talents? Yeah, I think when it comes to recruitment strategy, we all know about the importance of employer branding, right? Or it's about... How do you showcase yourself as the employer to join as opposed to the other employer? And what's interesting about this is um, employer branding and recruitment, it's a competition with everyone, regardless of industry, right? Because you can steal anybody's employee or you can you know, attract anybody's employee. So you really have to have a very strong culture and employer brand in place 
to be able to recruit. And that's what I think a lot of the younger generation are looking for. So they have a very online shopping mentality when it comes to recruitment or when it comes to applying for a job. So they look at the uh, different um, job portals and the job offers, and they go and apply for the ones that, with the brands that they recognize first, right? And if, and then after that, they go back and then they apply to those um, companies that they don't quite recognize. And because they don't quite know what's it like, they actually go on to review sites like Glassdoor. They go to review oh, sites their websites, like right? yeah. yeah, and they go and read up on what's it like, what's a sneak peek behind, uh, you know, what's it like working here as an engineer, right? What's the, what's the working environment like? What are the perks? What are the benefits? What's the culture? Everything. They try and read and gain as much information as they want about this. So in order to recruit companies must actually have uh, employer branding strategy in place where they look into what's being said online by people who have come and who, people who have gone, right? Uh, and people who are staying, right? They have to really track the data. I think that data is so important today to give you a real clear picture of who are the people who's coming into the organization, where are they coming from and where are they leaving to go to, right? So you get an idea who's who's kind of taking your talents away and who are you able to attract the talents from. Mm -hmm. So getting that kind of data and also making sure that online, right, you have enough content to talk about the company. So a lot of companies have started, uh, you know, doing videos over um, a day in the life of a software engineer in LinkedIn or mm -hmm. in Microsoft, right? What's it like to work in this role? then we are having a lot more leaders as well, you know, come and speak up about the organization, have a stronger personal brand on LinkedIn and being a lot more active and being a champion of certain causes that are aligned with the organization. All of these things help with the recruitment process and the employer branding strategy, right? And what's really key is for them to also be communicating about how we invest in our talents how do we add value to the employees who join us right so whether you get um, you know a flexibility in terms of working hours you have a three two or a two three hybrid working culture a working uh, calendar you have whether you have uh, a lot of investment in terms of training and development we invest in your skills or in your leadership right whether it is uh, related to how we do feedback and we have uh, we incorporate all of these things we, I talk about, a lot about this in the book, about the different key things that, you know, um, companies are doing. What was really interesting that I found out, uh, IBM actually has, um, you know, kind of empowered its employees, the leaders, the specialists, to also take on a secondary role of teaching. And they, yeah. and they actually use this as a recruitment exercise where as I teach, I spot talents of individuals who come for the certification but in that process, when I see someone who has, who is a high potential, I give them the offer of an interview. It's almost like these makes um, sense. coding, uh, you know, coding kind of uh, boot camps that they have to see, I give you a problem, if you can solve it, you get a job offer right away. But this is maybe a little bit more long term. They train them, give them the certification, and along the way, they, they bring on the talents who are there to, you know, get certified and learn, and um, it helps them to always be on the edge in terms of uh, getting the best talents. Yeah, they are really, really important points. And I think another thing that I've noticed more now is how companies are embracing social media more, right? You know, yeah. you, you never, yeah. I never thought in the past you'd see companies advertising their roles on TikTok, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> and, and Instagram reels and, and others. And they're understanding that in order for us to attract this talent and also this generation, we have to be where they live. You know, rather than trying to drag Absolutely. drag them to us to our corporate website, yeah. let's go to the platforms that they go on and use every single day, right? And uh, exactly. for a lot of lot of organizations, that was quite an uncomfortable <laughs> reality <laughs> to to be faced yeah. with. And uh, many of the leaders are uh, uh, also have this additional pressure that they need to build their own brand. You know, as mm. as a leader. Uh, as well, which wasn't something when I was a manager that I needed to think about. Oh, I, I need to, Chris needs to have a, a social media presence. I need to post and position myself as a leader in the space in order to attract the yeah. talent. So it's, it's, it's super interesting how this has evolved with technology.
Absolutely. It's it's changed. It's changed the entire dynamic of how you actually start recruiting. And uh, the 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 stronger the employer brand, the more fans you start, uh, you know, gathering. The more uh, you know, the higher the chances of you bringing in the right talents and the people who really fall in love with the company as an employee and and maybe even as a consumer. Yeah, I can tell you right now, every single one of my employees has come through my LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn. Uh, and, oh wow! Uh, yeah, not one. I've never actually ever posted a job on a job forum or platform ever. <laughs> uh, it's always been yeah. like reaching out, re- reaching out to people on LinkedIn. Then they can see. They see my profile, they see the background, they see I do the podcast, they see, they can hear, they can, you know, they can listen to 600 episodes <laughs> um, of, exactly. of, of Chris Rainey and all of these leaders and they know who I am, they know what I stand for, they, you know, they know the why and the purpose of HR leaders, so I don't have to explain that myself, you know, I can, yes, I can write, a, you know, I do, I still have the job postings, of course, which I do put on LinkedIn, but then I reach out to people directly on LinkedIn or they come to us for our LinkedIn network um as well Absolutely. and it shows the power of of that you really attract them you don't have to chase yes. you're not always <laughs> chasing you're able to attract these people naturally and it's always a good it's a better place to be in as opposed to be the one chasing yeah but it was also like what i say to them is backed up in reality right so what i'm you know a lot of times we've we've all been to interviews where we're kind of sold the dream right <laughs> and then <laughs> and then you and then you walk into the business and be and you're like wait a minute this is not what I signed up for. Uh, whereas you, <laughs> when you have that sort of that online presence or you're, you know, facing people through the camera, like I am, you know, you can't lie about those things. <laughs> it, exactly, it is very transparent exactly. um, as well. Yeah. You mentioned in, um, when you sent over the details, uh, blue tick anxiety. So I want to talk about that for a second, as we're talking about yeah. social media and <laughs> can you tell everyone a bit more about that if, if they're not already aware of it? Sure. So people ask me, like, what are some of the key, like, very millennial behaviors that you've noticed? And blue tick anxiety is one of the things that I mentioned to them. And, you know, millennials and Gen Zs, in fact, I'm, I'm including them as well. Um, they are the ones who kind of grew up with technology. They grew up with handphones and then smartphones, right? And for them, um, the virtual space is another place for them to interact with people, right? It is one of the places where they kind of chill out. Right. And um, and they've gotten so used to it. And as WhatsApp became more and more popular uh, and the blue tick uh, appeared in WhatsApp, it kind of started giving people the idea that, OK, this person has read the message. Right. So it's so that's where the blue tick comes from. Now, the, where does the blue tick anxiety come from is when, let's say, a new um, employee joins uh, a manager and he asks a question on WhatsApp. Hey, is it OK if I do this, this, this? The manager sees it on a weekend and uh, that gives the blue tick, but doesn't reply, <laughs> right? And yeah. um, that lack of response within the next two to three minutes gives the young person anxiety. Maybe the whole weekend. Say something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the whole weekend. They're like, why have they not replied? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did I say wrong? Did I say it wrongly? Should I have worded it differently? You know, why isn't this person responding? Um, you know, did I, should I have sent an email instead? You know, they kind of come up with all these different kinds of uh, scenarios in their head, which is kind of contributing to their anxiety. And that's what we call blue tick anxiety. And it's very, very common in the younger generation. In fact, when I was on a panel discussion, there was a, a, a radio DJ who said that, you know, after the smartphones and social media, she's been getting more requests of songs on Facebook and on Instagram, as opposed to people calling in. And yeah, they do that the now. Songs. You hear and it a lot. A, you hear that a lot now, don't you? When you on the radio, they don't say call in anymore or text. They say <laughs> message uh, yeah. uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Like you said, they ask for those messages instead. Yeah, exactly. So this generation has become less comfortable, or they they kind of second uh, second guess themselves when it comes to communicating with someone who's senior, and when they and they kind of try to craft the perfect message, the most professional message um, before they send it across. And when it still doesn't kind of deliver the result they want, which is an instant affirmation or instant re- response, they, they kind of get ang- anxious about the entire thing and think they did something wrong, right? Uh, whereas um, this is not exactly the case, right? Sometimes the person is just truly busy. And if it was really that urgent, then they should be as comfortable to pick up the phone and call, 
which is what the manager is expecting, by the way. But uh, it's funny. I just had that conversation that, with uh, Bruno, uh, my producer beforehand as well. Like you, it seems obvious to you that why don't you just pick up the phone and call, which is what I do. But mo- they yeah. don't do that. <laughs> They just they don't, that. <laughs> so they don't want that. They don't want. To, they don't want to have a phone call because it's more awkward and less comfortable because yeah. they've grown up texting back and forth. Whereas I'm the opposite. I I, I actually prefer the phone call over the messaging because that's how I grew up. Yeah. I grew up phoning, you know, people. Exactly. And if yeah. I have an issue, just call and ask. Just call and ask, <laughs> right? So what what can we do as managers and leaders then uh, to to make sure that we Get, keep this in mind. I, I think suppose. the first is to give them um, a clear cut. I mean, so a lot of this is supposed to be common sense, but it's not common practice. So it's common sense to us because it was common practice back then. But today, the common practice has changed. The common practice has become texting. Texting is the easier and the faster way to to communicate. So how do we make calling the common practice is when managers really sit down with the people and say, and really give them the directive that, you know, you can WhatsApp me, but for all urgent matters, I would just prefer you call me because that's the best way to help to, to get my input on anything that you need to clear urgently. I think just having that simple conversation, conversation right? Yeah. Mm. At the start of the onboarding or when you're starting out really helps because if, if the manager is thinking like, why isn't he calling me? And 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 the the millennial thinking, why isn't this person message responding to my WhatsApp message? There's a communication gap, and it's I've made I've made that mistake. Basic gap. Yeah, one of the feedbacks yeah. I got from the team recently is like, oh, we message you sometimes and you don't reply, and I'm like, why didn't you call me? And they're like, yeah, we messaged you, and I'm like. Yeah, but if, if it was important, just call me. This, that's my fault, you yeah. know, uh, for uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as well for not understanding that. So I've made that mistake that you're talking about um, as well. And uh, also my teams assume that if I've sent, they've sent me a Slack, will you Slack? Then, I, then I'm then i always going to see it and reply immediately, which is just not the case um, as yeah. well. So have sitting down and having that conversation and setting those clear boundaries. Uh, also making Absolutely. sure that, you know, if you message me on a weekend, I am not going to reply. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. spending time with right. family. So and also don't, setting don't those boundaries. Don't get anxious about that. Yeah. <laughs> don't get anxious about that. I'm just, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just spending time with my family. <laughs> you know, you or, didn't do anything wrong. I just don't reply uh, to work matters on the weekend. Right. Yeah. So having that clarity conversation is really important um, to bridge these small nuanced differences that we see across generations. Yeah. Is this similar to what you mentioned when you talk about ghosting amongst youth? So is that yeah. something different? Yeah, well, ghosting is also another unique. Um, so I never heard of that before until trick. I never. Oh, really? heard, I never heard of that until you messaged me well, about ghosting. ghosting oh. Kind of, um, it, it kind of uh, started out in the dating scene where you go on a date. Oh, you mean as in like you just oh you, you meet each other and never and never. And then you, oh, okay. And then, that's happened in the workplace. Oh, okay. Because it's much easier for me to just block you on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. <laughs> as opposed to telling you why it's not going to work out and why I don't like you or why I don't think we have a future together. That's a lot harder for them to communicate. And what's easier is just clicking a button that says block, right? So avoid the uncomfortable conversation. So basically they avoid the uncomfortable conversation through technology. Exactly. It's the same, it's the same um, problem. It's coming from the same problem of um, I'm scared. I'll say the wrong thing or I, I don't know how, how to manage this kind of high stress, high anxiety situation. So I just avoid it altogether. Right. So that's why they don't call. That's why they just read the text and, uh, you know, kind of get it done. It's much easier, much more convenient in that sense, but they don't know how they're leaving the other person feeling, right? The person's lost. Like, why did you, suddenly disappear on me Why are you replying to my messages did i do something wrong they they start doubting themselves that you know all of these things happen and it also happens in it's also kind of happening also in the employer space where they come for the interview uh, they say they are you know they go through the di- different rounds of interviews final round interview offer letter is given and then they ghost they di- just totally disappear they don't respond they don't turn up for the first day of work and when you try to contact them, they are uncontactable, right? And it's, again, I think something that they've kind of learned from uh, this ability to block and disappear because it's a lot easier for them to do that than to explain why they did what they did. Because they know what they're doing is wrong, but they don't want to just have to explain it and go through that kind of 
yeah. anxiety of explaining that. Well, it happens on yeah. both sides, right? I, I recommended um, a, f- a friend for an interview recently for a company that I knew that was hiring. They went through the rounds of interviews, got close all the way to, sort of, I think it was like the fourth round, and the company ghosted them, right? And, yeah. <laughs> um, and they messaged me saying, Hey, Chris, you know, sorry to be a pain. Um, haven't heard back. Do I, do I, do I message them say hi, mm. like, uh, chase them? I don't want to be annoying. I don't know. Do I chase the hiring manager? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, drop them a message, ask for feedback, you know, see, see and then they ghosted them still didn't say anything. Ooh. Right. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. this is a very well-known brand that everyone listening would know of and use their products. Mm and uh mm. again i was i was like okay just message them again maybe they was on holiday maybe they didn't see it you know and then nothing and mm. i can tell you right now the amount of anxiety that that person experienced and fear of failure and it was so bad it was such a terrible onboarding experience, experience. um yeah. they, they didn't actually yeah. end up getting the job and they found out maybe like a two weeks after we had that conversation but it was such a poor process mm. that that company had in yeah. place and the lack of clarity um as well especially yeah. as someone new coming into the workplace they should never experience that um as yeah. well so i kind of felt it first. and they were messaging me on whatsapp <laughs> back, back, back and forth about that uh, constantly um and as well it, it sucks when even after it's an introduction it's a personal introduction because that also yeah. kind of uh, makes it feel like you know it was an impersonal at least have the graciousness to say why we are not don't worry I, I i i gave them the, i told them don't worry yeah. <laughs> i gave yeah. i gave them my feedback i'm like i recommended someone to your job you need to treat them with respect and at least give them feedback especially as yeah. i as i have a good relationship with that business um as exactly. well so yeah it, it's 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 super, super interesting um um also i kind of want to be careful that we don't say that all millennials are like this right all the things of that course, we're all the things course. that we're talking about we have to make sure that we're not you know we're talking about bias i feel like we're being quite biased mm. <laughs> by making sure that you know <laughs> we're not saying that all millennials are lazy all, and, and and everything else that we've just said now so that's also important right Yes, absolutely. In fact, you know, the thing that we see about millennials is just the tip of the iceberg, as I would say, right? There's a lot more that people don't notice because everyone's just focusing on the tip, what's above the surface. But if you really get to know people on an individual basis, there's so much that they can contribute to teams and, uh, you know, to the companies, which often gets missed because that it's not it's not sensational news right so that's why we always tend to focus on what's on the tip of the iceberg but um, that being said there are generational differences it's just that not everyone embodies it to a t right there are of some course. people who don't in fact in fact uh, even in, within the millennials um, we have the zennials who are 1979 to about 1984 who kind of feel like they are part of a gen x and part of millennials right so they tend to feel like i i kind of fit both they are mm-hmm. kind of the cuspers right and they they feel like they are uh, a bit of both and so that's why it's important for us to know that you know this is just generationally speaking uh, in a bigger group these are the kind of um you know behaviors we see but it doesn't always necessarily of course uh, kind of apply to every single person yeah what are some of the other trends and sort of forces that you're seeing just widening that generational gap at work yeah, so the generational gap, the generation, we've always had a generational gap. Even back in the 1960s when when there were people in the workforce, right, we would see a generational gap. In fact, even though there wasn't a specific term for those generations, it's, everyone was just part of the silent generation, right? But uh, we did notice every every generation would kind of see like the younger generation and the older generation in a certain way. But what kind of has crystallized this generational gap in and widened it is the fact that uh, number one uh, parenting styles and social behaviors kind of changed dramatically uh, because uh, over time as baby boomers they were brought up by parents who went through the wall so very strict very directive mm-hmm. very do as i say children are meant to be uh, you know uh, just seen not heard right and it's basically a very top-down approach in terms of parenting and we see that being reflected also in the workplace right we have a very top-down approach back then by managers uh, to how you manage yeah. yeah so it's a command and control kind of atmosphere but as baby boomers became parents they decided they don't want to really have that kind of experience 
uh, you know, that they had his be a kids. parent like that. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be a nicer parent. I'll be a parent who, you know, gives my children what they want and I kind of give them everything that they're asking for. And that's where this term helicopter parenting came about because they're always there to protect the child uh, from whatever it is that, you know, may hurt them. And uh, what happened is the children, the millennials who grew up with that, started to associate the the adults as people who are there for their success. So we have uh, career school counselors, these parents, we have you know, teachers, everyone asking how can we be of service and support to your success. And that's the expectation that millennials have when they go into the workforce. So uh, the social uh, is one key thing. Then we have technology, which also kind of change the way we interact with the world quite a bit. And we also have the financial crisis that also, um, it, it really affected the way millennials think about loyalty to a job, right? So for example, when there's a crisis, we are seeing this today even, right? Uh, once there is a crisis, uh, if, the, if the company sees that they've hired too many talents, they start letting them you, go. Basically, one Meta. One. You're talking about Meta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Uh, they're, they're, they're so not, many in the tech industry. So many, right? yeah. But yeah, they're the ones under fire right now. But yeah, many companies right now. You're right. So many in the tech space. So, so the loyalty to the company has switched to loyalty to myself. I rather be loyal to myself. Mm -hmm. And focus, if I'm not growing in this company and I don't see any prospects of myself growing in this company in the next two to three years, then I want to move to a company that gives me better pay, higher level, higher raise, right? And uh, better benefits. So they see that as their growth path, two to three years here, two to three years there. And I get a better, better than promotion <laughs> kind of benefits when I jump company, right? So all of these technological, social, and financial trends actually widen the gap. And that's why millennials are the targets of all the hate and criticism, because they are the ones who grew up in a different world and are showcasing the different behaviors, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically that. what has kind of changed. I never really uh, thought about that. Did. The impact of the parent inside is so true. Like you're so yeah. right. Like I grew up in that very much command and control parenting environment. Yeah. And I went, yeah. in, I went into a company where the leadership and the managerial style was kind of command and control. Mm -hmm. You do what we mm -hmm. say, because we are the senior and you do this, <laughs> you work for me. <laughs> and then when we I, but, but when I became yeah. a manager, I wanted to change that. And I kind of went mm -hmm. to more of a, how can I support your growth and development? I'm here to serve you and more that servant yeah. leadership you know right Seven leadership exactly. uh, and now as a exactly. parent you know bringing up robin who's four again my focus is how can i help robin grow develop flourish as a child yeah, as well so exactly. I, never, I never really put that together to be honest um, yeah, as well. there, there is a correlation in, in in the way the parenting styles uh, back then and uh, the managerial styles uh, and leadership styles yeah listen before i let you go last question um what would be your parting piece of advice? We've covered so much for you know our, our audience, our HR leaders from some of the world's leading global brands. They're looking after millions of employees. You know, what would be the one parting piece of advice you give them? Train your managers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, really invest in your managers because uh, the managers are the ones who are on the ground dealing. If the manage you, you can have the best. You can have all the best, uh, you know, kind of uh, offers and, you know, initiatives. But if the manager isn't supportive of the individual, if the person, if the manager is incapable of um, motivating and inspiring the individual, of uh, keeping them accountable, if the manager lacks those skills, all the activities the company and the HR do will not amount or add up. It really boils down to training the managers. If the managers are trained, and if they have the skill sets to engage and the competencies to motivate the millennials and the Gen Zs, in fact, right, they will see a lot more engagement, retention, and it will also increase the employer brand of the organization. Yeah. Listen, love that. Um, where can people connect with you? If they want to reach out, connect with you, where's the best place? Well, LinkedIn is the best place. So you can find me at... Uh, you know, LinkedIn, you just type in my name, Vivek Yani, and uh, you'll be able to find me. Amazing. Well, listen, thanks for coming on the show. 
Um, super interesting topic for everyone listening. Make sure you grab a copy of the book is engaging millennials, the seven fundamentals to recruit, reward and retain the largest generation in the workforce. There'll also be a link in the description below to connect with Vivek on LinkedIn. So if you click where, where, wherever you're listening or watching right now, all of those links will be in the description below. But apart from that, thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the time with the family and I'll see you again soon. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye.